Order! Order! We begin today with speeches to mark Her Majesty the Queen becoming our longest serving monarch. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today Her Majesty the Queen becomes the country's longest reigning monarch. And it is, of course, typical of her selfless sense of service that she would have us treat this day just like any other. But, Mr. Speaker, while I rarely advocate disobeying Her Majesty, least of all in her own Parliament, I do think it's right that today we should stop and take a moment as a nation to mark this historic milestone and to thank Her Majesty for the extraordinary service that she's given to our country over more than six decades. Mr. Speaker, Her Majesty the Queen inspires us all with her incredible service, her dignified leadership, and the extraordinary grace with which she carries out her duties. And I'd like to say a word about each. Mr. Speaker, on her 21st birthday, in a radio broadcast from Cape Town, over four years before she would accede to the throne, the then Princess dedicated her life to the service of the Commonwealth, saying, and I quote, I declare before you all that my whole life whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. It is one thing for a 21-year-old to utter those inspiring words. It is another to live by them for more than 60 years. For all of us in this chamber who seek to play our part in public service, it is truly humbling to comprehend the scale of service that Her Majesty the Queen has given this country. Mr Speaker, the reign of Queen Elizabeth has been a golden thread running through three post-war generations. And she's presided over more than two-thirds of our history as a full democracy, with everyone being able to vote. When I was born, Her Majesty had already been reigning for 14 years. When the father of this House, our longest-serving member, was first elected to this chamber, Her Majesty had already been Queen for 18 years. In 63 years and 216 days, she's worked with 12 Prime Ministers, six Archbishops of Canterbury, nine Cabinet Secretaries. She's answered three and a half million pieces of correspondence, sent over 100,000 telegrams to centenarians across the Commonwealth, and met more people than any other monarch in history. And yet, Mr Speaker, whether it is something we suspect she enjoys, like the Highland Games, or something we suspect she might be slightly less keen on, such as spending New Year's Eve in the Millennium Dome, she never, <laughs> she never ever falters. Her selfless sense of service and duty have earned her unparalleled respect and admiration, not only in Britain, but around the world. Turning to her leadership, Her Majesty exemplifies the unique combination of tradition and progress that has come to define us as a nation. She has been a rock of stability in an era in which our country has changed so much, providing an enduring focal point for all her people. But she has also recognised the need to embrace change. As she said in an address to both Houses of Parliament back on her Golden Jubilee in 2002, for if a jubilee becomes a moment to define an age, then for me we must speak of change. Change has become a constant. Managing it has become an expanding discipline. The way we embrace it defines our future. Her Majesty's contribution to shaping the future of the Commonwealth has been particularly extraordinary. Some doubted whether this organisation would succeed, but she has assiduously supported it, growing it from just seven members in 1952 to 53 today. She has played the leading role in building a unique family of nations that spans every continent, all the main religions, and nearly a third of the world's population. As a diplomat and ambassador for Britain, it is hard to overstate what she's done for our country, representing us on 265 official visits to 116 different countries, including making 22 visits to Canada alone. And from her post-apartheid visit to South Africa to her state visit to Ireland, we've seen time and again how the presence and judicious words of Her Majesty can build partnership and progress like no other. She's held in deep affection by leaders around the world, and even ardent Republicans fall under her spell. (laughs) Mr Speaker, as we commemorate this historic milestone, I know that Her Majesty would want us to pay a particular tribute to the service and support of her whole family, not least the Duke of Edinburgh, who stood by her side every day of her reign. Mr Speaker, throughout her long service, the Queen has carried herself with an extraordinary grace and presence. She's led a gentle evolution of our monarchy, bringing it closer to the people while maintaining its dignity. 
She pioneered the first televised Christmas Day message over 30 years before we allowed cameras into this house. She opened up the Royal Collection and Palaces, and she invented the Royal Walkabout so she could meet more people on her visits. People who meet the Queen often talk about it for the rest of their lives. And I'm sure that I speak for all of my 11 predecessors when I say that going to see the Queen to form a government and then meeting her once a week is one of the most enjoyable, inspiring and humbling honours of this office. Mr Speaker, when I joined Her Majesty for her state visit to Germany earlier this year, I learned that there are many female sovereigns that the German call die Königin, but there is only one they call die Queen. In fact, the German dictionary, the Duden, provides as its example sentence, the Queen is coming on a state visit to Berlin, and then offers one grammatical, one grammatical prescript, there is no plural. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the Queen is our Queen, and we could not be more proud of her. She has served this country with unerring grace, dignity and decency, yeah. and long may she continue to do so. Yeah. Harriet Harman. Yeah. I'm, I'm pleased to follow the Prime Minister in his tribute to Her Majesty the Queen. And as he did, I want to start with those words that she said when she was 21 years old. She said, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. Those words, remarkable from such a young woman, were a solemn vow to this country, which she has kept through the 63 years, 218 days of her reign. She hadn't expected to succeed to the throne, but even before she was crowned, she was clear that her life would be dedicated to the service of her country. There can be no doubt of the commitment that she has made in the public service she has given and continues to give. Even today, at the age of 89, she's undertaking a public engagement. Her life has been a great sweep of British history, the Second World War, the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and she's presided over the transition from empire to commonwealth. Her reign spans profound changes in all respects, in work life, family life, our communities and technology. She's gone from sending telegrams to sending tweets. At a time of so much change, her reign is the reassurance of continuity, a defining feature of this country, both at home and abroad. At home, she's done thousands of official engagements, visits, walkabouts, meeting and greeting the public, and welcoming thousands to Buckingham Palace every year. Just in the one year of her Golden Jubilee, she visited 70 cities and towns across this country. There's a great commitment to her in every part of this country. Abroad, she's been tireless in her international engagements, and in her long reign, she's made official visits to more than 116 countries. It's no exaggeration to say that she is admired by billions of people all around the world, particularly in the Commonwealth, including those who come and to live here in the UK, like many in my constituency of Camberwell and Peckham. People respect the fact that she has stayed fastidiously neutral and above politics. Yet at times she has played a significant role in key political moments, like the extraordinary personal generosity she displayed in the peace process in Northern Ireland. She's now on her 12th Prime Minister. We on these benches had hoped that she would now be on her 13th. <laughs> she she reigns over 140 million people. That is a huge number, nearly as many as the l number of the Labour Party's registered supporters. <laughs> and it's, um, it's, it's, it, is entirely, it is entirely characteristic of her that she has let it be known that she doesn't want there to be a fuss made about today, but we are making a fuss, and deservedly so. We send her our warmest congratulations, our appreciation, and above all, our thanks. Sir yeah. Gerald Howarth. Uh, I uh, do uh, contribute to this uh, uh, tribute to Her Majesty with some trepidation, but as the member responsible for the home of the British Army, I hope I might be allowed just to say 
a, a few words. Her Majesty has been an absolute inspiration to our armed forces, yeah. and her leadership and her commitment to her duty uh, has been one which has served our armed forces well. I endorse everything that the Prime Minister has said, and I'm sure we all do. She has been the embodiment of duty, and indeed, uh, when I look at my diaries, I'm sure we all do, and one finds that one's got that, um, the invitation to the great event in the, uh, in the Aldershot constituency social uh, calendar, which is the Farnborough Donkey Derby, to be held on Bank Holiday Monday. And I consult Lady Howarth and say, um, shall we be going to the Donkey Derby? And she said, we went there last year. Uh, and I said, and Her Majesty does all sorts of things every single year. And she has done a fantastic service to this nation. And the only other point I wish to add, Mr. Speaker, is this. Every coin of the realm proclaims that Her Majesty is Queen. But there are two other letters, and most of our people do not know what those two letters mean. They are FD. And that she may be uh, the first Lord of the Treasury above my right arm from the Prime Minister. They don't stand for Finance Director. Uh, they stand for Fedea Defensor, Defender of the Faith. And I think Her Majesty has lived up to her coronation oath more faithfully than any former sovereign of this realm. And she has been an inspiration to us in her faith. And I think all of us uh, sit down at Christmas time and enjoy Her Majesty's Christmas message, not just to us and our constituents, but to the entire Commonwealth and the world. And it is her faith which shines through unequivocally but quietly in her Christmas message, and I think it is her faith which has given her the strength to do what she has done for our country, and we should be a very grateful nation indeed to be served by a sovereign of such faith and such commitment as Elizabeth II. Yeah. Sir Gerald Kaufman. Uh, Mr Speaker, I well remember the day when King George VI died and the Queen flew back from East Africa where she was undertaking a visit. She left this country as a princess and she came back as a queen. And her reign over this country ever since then has been <coughs> exemplary, not simply to our own country, but to all of the world. She manages to combine States, stately behaviour with thorough hard work. She maintains this country as a democracy in a way that no president could conceivably do because her, it is not simply that she is impartial, but she is beyond politics. She makes it possible for us to have a stable, democratic government. <coughs> I'm not saying that she makes it possible to have an admirable government. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the great quality of Her Majesty is that we do not know what she thinks of the government. She simply maintains it in a way that makes this country the greatest democracy in the world. Yeah. Not, only, not only does she do her job carrying out a public engagement as she is today, but she works hard at carrying out those jobs. Recently, she came to my constituency and visited Gorton Monastery, a majestic building which had fallen into dereliction, but which had been brought back to fruition as a public venue. And she made herself available to people, she met people, she lunched with the people who had come. But what struck me most was the fact that she knew everything about the renovation of Gorton Monastery and was able to discuss with those people who have brought it back into use the most minute facts 
about how that had happened. She's a wonderful queen. She is an upholder of democracy. She is a hard worker, and we send our heartfelt wishes to her on this day. Yeah. Might be for the convenience of the House to know that there are a further eight colleagues seeking to catch my eye, so consideration for each other will help. Mr Henry Bellingham. Yeah. Mr Speaker, it's a pleasure to follow the earlier speeches, and I'd like to state my gratitude for a remarkable ongoing life of service and duty. And throughout this, Her Majesty is serving our country and our constituents with great grace and dignity. Now, I'm one of only two MPs who represent her private estates. In my case, it's uh, Sandringham in West Norfolk. And under her passionate guidance, Sandringham has been transformed from a sleepy agricultural estate to one of the most thriving and diversified estates in Britain. Sixty years ago, the vast majority of estate income would have come from agricultural rents. Now, the majority will come from tourism, leisure, museums, public access and property rents, all overseen by Her Majesty's incredible eye for detail. Mm -hmm. Of course, there is still a very successful home farm which sits alongside a world-class thoroughbred stud where Her Majesty has meticulously built up numerous famous bloodstock lines. Mr Speaker, although Sandringham is very much a private retreat, the affairs of state are never too far away with a relentless stream of red boxes. But during her two or three visits a year, Her Majesty always finds time to come to a number of local events. So, for example, in recent years, she has visited local schools, museums, charitable and other voluntary groups and businesses. And I've noticed, Mr Speaker, on these occasions, she invariably, once she's had a chance to talk to the Mayor and the MP, she then wants to meet real people. <laughs> and but, but probably as a result, more people in Kingston and West Norfolk who have actually met Her Majesty than any other part of the country. And I'd just like to say, Mr Speaker, on behalf of my constituency, on behalf of the local community, I'd like to put on record my deep gratitude to Her Majesty for enhancing the lives of so many people and bringing the joy to so many families. And long may she carry on reigning over us. Yeah. Mr Angus Robertson. Yeah. Much, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, it's a pleasure to take part in these commemorative proceedings uh, on this important day on behalf of the, the Scottish National Party. We've seen many remarkable landmarks through the long reign of uh, Her Majesty the Queen, during which there's been a transition from empire uh, through the independence of scores of nations, many of which continue with Her Majesty as head of state uh, or in close connection through the at Commonwealth, but amongst all of the statistics that I've seen, there's one exact figure uh, which is missing, and perhaps it's because no one could keep uh, tabs in any circumstance uh, to the literally millions of people that the Queen has personally met. She's travelled the length and breadth of this kingdom over decades performing her public duties and meeting people. She's regularly travelled to the 16 other states where she's head of state meeting people. And Her Majesty has visited 128 different countries during her 63 uh, years and seven months tenure. Her international state and Commonwealth uh, visits, uh, she ascended to the throne in 1952, have taken her on 270 uh, trips. There are literally millions of people at home and overseas, by one account, over four million people who have met her personally, and even more mind-boggling numbers of people who have seen her on her visits and engagements. Those of uh, us who have had the honour uh, will attest to her personal interest, attention, kindness, and amazing ability to put people at their ease. That was evident the first time I had the honour uh, to meet her. When on learning that I was the Member of Parliament for Murray, she inquired whether I listened to Mr Wogan uh, on the radio. I, I must confess I was totally stumped as I couldn't think of a connection, an obvious connection, between Murray and Terry Wogan's then Radio 2 show. She saved me from my discomfort by explaining that Terry Wogan appeared to delight in the regularity of weather and traffic reports, which confirmed that the first road in the UK to close due to snow, and probably in the autumn, was between Tom and Towel in Murray and Cock Bridge, which is close to Balmoral. Her Majesty, as we know, has a particular affinity with Scotland. She is known to delight in her stays at Balmoral and the neighbouring constituency of my honourable friend, the member for West Aberdeenshire and 
Kincardine, and it's fitting that her record-long reign surpasses that of her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, who also had a tremendous affinity with Scotland in general yeah. and Balmoral in particular. Today, Her Majesty marks this landmark by being in Scotland with the Duke of Edinburgh and First Minister Nicola Sturgeon at the opening of the Scottish Border Railway. It's the biggest rail project in over a century, perhaps since the reign of Queen Victoria, uh, and that today the Queen is in Scotland and is working as usual on this special day is much appreciated and totally in keeping with her remarkable record of public service. Next year, Mr Speaker, the Queen celebrates her 90th birthday and come the 6th of February 2022, Her Majesty would become the first British monarch to celebrate a platinum jubilee. Yeah, yeah. We look forward to that. We wish her and her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, well for the future and share the appreciation for her and his public service over 63 years. Yeah. Caroline Spellman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On behalf of the Church of England, I would like to pay tribute in this House to the Queen as Head of the Church for the faithful and inspiring leadership she has provided to the Church, regularly speaking about the importance of her faith in her personal life and in her role, not just on the Christmas broadcast, but all round the year. In the other place, the Bishop of Peterborough will be placing a tribute uh, in the House of Lords. And up and down the country, churches will be celebrating in services and other events her long reign. We wish her many more happy years to reign. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Nigel Dobbs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, we as one today in this House pay tribute to Her Majesty. Uh, her example of service dedication and duty is now as unmatched as the length of her glorious reign. Uh, our Queen has, as the Prime Minister has said, seen many Prime Ministers, Archbishops and others, and indeed nine speakers come and go, and I'm sure there's more to come. <laughs> we admire... <laughs> we, uh, we admire, Mr Speaker, the steadfast way in which she has reigned over us. We respect the deep faith that, she has helped, that has helped her to do so. And perhaps today we should remember the personal sacrifice involved. On her 18th birthday, as has been mentioned, in South Africa, the Queen swore, no matter how long or how short her life, to devote it to the nation and to the Commonwealth. She has done so magnificently, with the enormous support of the Duke of Edinburgh. But her reign began sooner than she could ever have wished, as her beloved father, King George VI, who bore the crown in the darkest days of war, was taken from her and from us far too soon. That Her Majesty, in the face of such early sorrow, has never wavered is tribute to the strength of character we as a people have been so fortunate to enjoy in our wonderful monarch. We, her kingdoms, her subjects, are united in her, in love, loyalty and respect. Long live the Queen. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Tim Farron. Um, it's a, a great honour uh, to be able to pay tribute to Her Majesty on this very important day. I have only uh, 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 managed to meet Her Majesty on, on two occasions. Obviously, in the years to come, I expect an audience uh, more regularly. Um, but uh, I, I, I met her on, on the first occasion. I met her. She gave me advice on how to uh, cope with casework. On the second occasion, on her visit to Kendal in Westmoreland, uh, there was very nearly an incident when a very well-meaning um, a local councillor, a councillor Walker, decided to, I can only say, lunge across a crowd of 30 or 40 people carrying a bar of Kendall mint cake to offer to Her Majesty, which she accepted with great grace, and I'm sure uh, 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 looking forward to enjoying it. Uh, I have to say that the security services were less excited, or indeed rather very excited, uh, by that particular lunge. I can also thank Her Majesty uh, for the occasion of her Silver Jubilee in 1977, where she gave me personally, my first and so far only uh, experience of being able to dance around a uh, maypole. Um, we are, I think, as a, as a, as a civilisation, we are very keen, aren't we, to categorise ourselves by our generations. Are we baby boomers? Are we Thatcher's children? Are we Generation X? The fact is, all of us here are new Elizabethans. All of us here have lived through that age, those 63 years and 218 days. 
when Queen Elizabeth II has reigned over us all. And those values that she has embodied, that actually stand for all of us here, are about decency, they're about service, it's about, ci about civilization, about stability, about family. And they are things that underpin our civilization. And it is all the more important when we recognize that Her Majesty occupies the most senior position in our society, the most privileged indeed position in our society. But she is marked, or her conduct is marked by humility and service, not claiming the grandeur of office. So it is on this great day that, on behalf of all people in my party and in my county, the way we pay tribute to her service and her humility. Long live the Queen. To the Honourable Gentleman. Sir Peter Bottomley. Yeah. Can I add the thanks of everyone involved in all the voluntary organisations and charities to which the Queen has given leadership and inspiration over the years? Yeah. 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 A great speech. Yeah. Possibly the Honourable Gentleman's greatest ever. <laughs>